It is good to be a second choice rather than no choice, right? <laughs> and here's your clicker. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, Georgette met me before two years ago, but I didn't impress her then, so she didn't remember that she met me before two years ago. <laughs> um, we actually met at a, a meeting somewhere in D.C., somewhere here. I don't remember what it was, but I remember her and her heart for the unborn, and she impressed me. So when she called and asked, could I come, I'm like, sure, I'd love to. But I wasn't planning on coming to the March for Life this year, but clearly God had other plans, and he made sure that I got here. So I am ever so grateful to him for that. So she asked me to talk about abortion in the hood. What is that? So. Everybody thinks, what does it say? I can't read it. Yes. Anybody know what skin colorism is? What is that? Skin colorism? You know, we talk about races, and we talk about racism, but that's anti biblical and it's anti Christ. There's only one race. And that's the human race. But we have given the abortion industry and the eugenicists room to redefine what God said into what man said. So I'm going to do a, a little history lesson. And I can't even read those slides, so I'm going to ignore those. <laughs> um, OK, so so. Everybody know Charles Darwin? Everybody know his crazy cousin, Sir Francis Galton? Sir Francis Galton was Charles Darwin's cousin, and he was as crazy as a bed bug in the rug in June. <laughs> and he decided that some people were well born and others were not. And so he created a pseudoscience called eugenics which means well-born. And so his cousin, Charles Darwin, came along and said, well, we know who's well-born and who's not. And he wrote a book, Origin of the Species. Anybody know what the rest of the title of that book is? The Preservation of the Races in the Struggle for Life. That's where we got defining one another by our skin color rather than by what God said. Because if we go to the book of Genesis, when Noah and the sons got off the boat, God said each one of them would be known by their tongue, their clan, and their nation. So prior to Charles Darwin and his crazy cousin, Sir Francis Galton, people were known by the nation they originated out of. So if you originated out of Ethiopia, you were Ethiopian. If you originated out of uh, China, you were Chinese. If you originated out of Russia, you were Russian. And there was no distinction based on your physical characteristics. It was based on your nation, your clan, and your tongue. So in other words, I'm an American <laughs> from America <laughs> that speaks English. And I'm from the clan Davis. That's how people were identified. But we bought into this idea that there were different races. And then along comes Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. Okay, here are your slides, and you just sweep that way. Oh, and awesome. See, you guys are awesome. Magic. <laughs> so along comes um, Clarence Gamble, I mean, Margaret Sanger who decides that we definitely need to deal with these people who are not well born. And since Charles Darwin told us it was based on race, and she decided that the Negroes were the race who were not well born, so she launched a Negro project in cahoots with a man, Clarence Gamble, of the Procter & Gamble fortune. 
The Negro Project, according to Gamble, sought to bring about a major birth rate reduction among the Negroes. So they decided they were going to enlist ministers to aid in uh, promoting the project. And Gamble said, well, let's not stop at uh, ministers. Let's get physicians. Because there is great danger that the project will fail because the Negroes think it a plan of extermination. Hence, let's appear to let the colored run it. So Sanger and Gamble went and enlisted men of God to begin to preach birth control at that time from the pulpit. And they got black physicians to do the same. So let me give you an, a modern day example. One example of a physician is named Willie Parker. Anybody ever heard of Willie? Yeah, Willie is a piece of work. <laughs> Willie decides that, of course, the baby in the womb is a person. It's not a puppy dog, right? But it doesn't have any rights. And so the right of the mother supersedes the right of the child to live. And so he's a good Samaritan, he says, because he is helping these women who otherwise would be forced into having an unwanted child. So he's helping the woman, not the baby. Not much has changed. Planned Parenthood lets us know in no uncertain terms that Sanger's early efforts remain the hallmark of Planned Parenthood's mission. And Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg confirmed that when we got abortion, it was to slow the growth in populations we don't want too many of. She said that in a New York Times magazine article in 2009. So what happened after Sanger and her cohort Gamble began to introduce these eugenic concepts? Well, you can see, oh, I can see, <laughs> you can see that um, many of our states, about 34 of our states had eugenic boards. Planned Parenthood's members sat on that board, on the boards across the country, and they did forced involuntary sterilization on people that they considered dysgenic. Our first eugenic board was introduced in Indiana in 1910. So we think that Hitler initiated eugenics and the extermination of people based on their race. But if you go back and look at the Nuremberg trials, um, you will see that it wasn't um, Hitler. It was Sanger and her cohorts long before there was a Hitler. So in 1969, Planned Parenthood introduced this memo, it's called the Jaffe Memo. And it was the president of Planned Parenthood World and the vice president of something or the other, where they talked about how they were going to implement the eugenics program. If you can see that little tiny print, they said things like, we're going to encourage homosexuality, that we're going to do sterilization that if you don't have children, they put you in a new tax bracket. I mean, they had it all laid out, exactly what we are seeing in our culture today. You will find it in the Jaffe memo, where they, in plain sight, are telling you, this is how we're going to control populations in the United States and around the world. At the same time that Planned Parenthood was scheming their thing, we had the, the formation of the National Organization of Women. They decided that they wanted to destroy the American family. So they said they had a meeting in upstate New York where they said, why are we here today to make revolution? What kind of revolution, a cultural revolution? 
And how do we make cultural revolution? By destroying the American family. And how do we destroy the family? By destroying the American patriarch. And how do we destroy the American patriarch? By taking away his power. How do we do that? By destroying monogamy. How can we destroy monogamy? By promoting promiscuity, eroticism, prostitution, and homosexuality. So is it any wonder we had the Harvey Weinstein and the Jeffrey Epstein and all of those kind of folk around us? Because National Organization of Women decided to destroy the American family. Now what does that have to do with the Negroes? Well, if you go back in history, you will see that in the 1960s and early 70s, about 75% of the black families were headed by two parents. Today, it's upside down. 73% of our families are headed by women. So they succeeded, if not in destroying all of our families, at least the black family was destroyed. At the same time, that now was organizing and the Jaffe people were pushing their dogma into our culture. We had President Richard Milhouse Nixon in the White House. And he was an avid eugenicist who believed in population control based on your skin color. So if you go and you listen to the, the tapes, because you know he taped everything, <laughs> he said, a majority of people in Colorado voted for abortion. I think a majority of people in Michigan are for abortion. I think in both cases, well, certainly in Michigan, they will vote for it because they think what's going to be aborted generally are the little black bastards. And he had a whole bunch more stuff that he said that you can Google. And you can hear it for yourself. These are his words, not mine. So in that environment, we got Roe v. Wade. Nixon, a eugenicist, what we now call racist, but he was a skin colorist in the White House. National Organization of Women, promoting promiscuity, et cetera and Planned Parenthood following the mission of their leader, Margaret Sanger, in controlling the black birth rate by promoting birth control and abortion. That's where we got Roe v. Wade. And if you look at what they said in Roe v. Wade, there's one sentence in that case that just, when I saw it, it just took my breath away. And... Um, Justice Blackman said, Blackman said, in addition, population growth, pollution, poverty, and racial overtones tend to complicate and do not simplify the problem. Why is that sentence in there? Norma McCorvey, who allegedly was seeking an abortion, she was Caucasian. What, what does skin color have to do with that? They were signaling their eugenicist friends, we got you. And this is going to happen. The companion case to Roe, though, was Dovey Bolton. How many know Dovey Bolton? We spent ages talking about the viability of the baby, Roe v. Wade, and it's not a blob of tissue, it's a baby. But the reality is Dovey Bolton didn't care about the viability of the child, and it legalized abortion all the way up to the ninth month depending on what state you lived in. So Planned Parenthood in 2008, and see, they hide this stuff in plain sight. And we don't look at it that way because we're thinking about the lives in the womb that are being taken, but we don't know the underlying, the undergirding uh, uh, reasons for that had to do with a person's skin color has nothing to do with women's rights, nothing. And Planned Parenthood told us in their 2008 tax filing 
that their mission was to achieve a population of optimum size. Well, what population were they looking for? Well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg the next year said, we're going to get rid of the populations we don't want too many of. But we know Sanger had a Negro project. So in 2012, an organization called Protecting Black Life commissioned a study to see where are the Planned Parenthoods located. There was a whole big hoopla over time about uh, zip codes being used to show where they were. Well, zip codes are mailing districts. They're not going to tell you the demographics, really, of who's there. So Protecting Black Life looked at uh, census tract data rather than zip codes. And what they found was this. The blue dots are black people. The red dots are Latinos. 79% of Planned Parenthood's surgical facilities are within a two-mile walking radius of a black or Latino neighborhood. 79%. So who's going in these Planned Parenthoods? Because I'm sorry to say, ain't no Caucasian women busting in the hood to go <laughs> kill their baby. Who's, who, who's going in there? And not only who's going in there, but their facilities have gotten larger and larger. These facilities are 10,000 square feet or larger. The second largest abortion facility in the world is in Houston, Texas, Planned Parenthood. In the entire world, second only to the one in China. Whose babies are they killing? And right now, in Richmond, Virginia, um, they are constructing a new Planned Parenthood that the previous Planned Parenthood had five surgical rooms. This one is going to have 12 surgical rooms. So that one with five surgical rooms was able to do 8,600 abortions a year. How many are they going to be able to do if they have 12 surgical rooms? And it's right next door to a friend of mine's church in Church Hill, which is a black neighborhood in Richmond. They also constructed a new one in Fairview Heights, Illinois. They did, they are, did one in the Charlotte Cherry community, which is a product, the oldest black neighborhood in the city of Charlotte. They are constructing one in Birmingham, Alabama, just a few blocks away from the 16th Street Baptist Church. And I just found out about a month ago they are now constructing a larger facility in Newport Ritchie, Florida. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is they're doing it under the cloak of darkness. They pull the construction permits under the name of an LLC, and no one knows that they're getting a Planned Parenthood in their neighborhood until the building goes up and the signs on the door. So they want to stop us. But in the media, they tell you, oh, no, abortion is not our primary business. We do pap smears. We do uh, breast exams. You know, at one point, they were claiming they did mammograms, which they never did, ever. Um, uh, and they, they give you this notion that they are providing real medical services to women. Well, that is a lie straight from the pit. Because in every category, their services to women have gone down. And this graphic shows you, and you can download this yourself uh, from the Radiance Foundation, um, but less care no matter what. Their services have plummeted. But what hasn't plummeted is abortion. And when President Trump first said that he was going to remove Title X funds from Planned Parenthood, he went to Cecile Richards at that time and said, if you will um, not do abortions, you can keep getting Title X. And her response was, Planned Parenthood is proud to provide abortion, a necessary service that's as vital to our mission 
as birth control or cancer screenings. What was their mission? Well, they told us in 2008 to achieve a population of optimum size. And what population are they achieving that with? Um, the black community, the Negro Project. So the good news is that the number of abortions and the abortion rate fell by about 2% since 2015. And so if you look at the numbers, um, the overall abortion rate has fallen significantly since 2007. Um, and since eight, 1980, the, the number of abortions have fallen by uh, more than 50%. But what does that mean to the black community? In the black community, the news is not good. 38% of the abortions in 2016, the most recent year that the CDC is reporting, were on black women of childbearing age. Now, I want to put this number in perspective for you. Only 3% of black women at any given point in time are of childbearing age. While black women comprise 13% of our population in America, only 3% of us are having babies. See, I'm too old now, unless God wants to do a John the Baptist, I mean, a Jesus thing. And I don't see that happening since I ain't got no husband. But Mary wasn't married either, so it could happen. Miracle. 3% um, getting 38% of the abortions? How can that be? There's something unnatural happening there. And it's because we are being targeted. Planned Parenthood's most recent report just came out. And in 2018, Planned Parenthood committed 345,672 abortions. They are the largest abortion uh, provider in the nation. That increased nearly 4% from 2017 and 3.5% from 2011. In the past 10 years, abortions at Planned Parenthood have risen nearly 7%, from 324,000 to more than 345,000. You know, back in the day, we lamented being put on the slave block and auctioned off to the highest bidder. But you know what? That same thing is happening today. David DeLayden with the Center for Medical Progress just went through an extensive trial in California where Planned Parenthood is suing him civilly, sued him civilly. And the judge was so biased that it was just ridiculous how biased he was. So I fully expect that that case is going to be overturned. But the good news out of that case was he got several a Planned Parenthood's physicians and other companies that they were selling the baby body parts to to acknowledge under oath that they were, in fact, selling the baby body parts. So while we're not on the auction block today, we are on the auction block in these Planned Parenthood abortion centers where they sell our baby brains, they sell our baby and by the way, if they're selling the baby's brain, the baby had to be born alive. They're selling little boys' gonads are particularly price, pricey for Planned Parenthood. They're auctioning off black folk today just like they did in the 1800s when slavery was legal. So as a result of that, more than 20 million black lives have been lost to abortion. 20 million, that's more than the entire black population in 1960 America. In 1960, there were 18,873, I think, thousand black people. It's a genocide to us. 
So abortion in the hood is not good. Abortion in the hood is genocide. And I covet your prayers. I covet your prayers to help us save the black community in America. I pray, I am begging God to give me an opportunity to get to President Trump. We must stop this. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe if we stop abortion in the hood, we'll stop abortion in America because it's always been about population control of the people we don't want too many of. And with that, I will take your questions. Thank you, Catherine. That was awesome. Well done, darling. All right, so we did get time for questions. Um, anybody have anything they want to ask Catherine? Yo. Yo. Oh, yo, I got, I got a yo. A yo. <laughs> Coming to the yo. Here we go. When you put the prices up there, on that, I, are you trying to tell me that when they abort a baby, and there's some, the lungs and the heart, that they use that for transplant? Or could you t define that? Medical it's medical research. Medical research. research. Medical research. <laughs> and they paid that much money? Yes. <laughs> to the point, I don't know if you had the heart to watch all of David's videos. But on one of them, one of the doctors said, I want a Lamborghini. She felt she could make enough money from selling the body parts of the baby she aborted to buy herself a Lamborghini. Yeah. David delighted in, in 2015. So if you go to Center for Medical Progress, there's a section that investigative videos, I think is what the title is. And he had a lot of them before the court um, put an injunction against him that he couldn't release anymore. And one of the most disturbing one of those videos was of a young lady named Holly. Holly worked for STEM Express, one of the companies that was purchasing the baby body parts. Her affect is so chilling as she's telling you what she observed. And unfortunately, Holly began to drink after that, and she died from alcohol poisoning. She could never recover herself. Um, these people are evil, wicked evil. Yes, sir. Um, er earlier we saw an article about, uh, I think it was here in D.C., of a abortion clinic being opened in the celebration that they had. Mm -hmm. right. And there were a large number of black pastors there. Yeah. What are the black churches doing in the black communities for this? I'm so glad you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right. There are some black pastors that are a part of the Negro Project. Remember, Clarence Gamble and Margaret Sanger said, let's go to the minister. Well, if you look at what, they, what they're doing and what they have done. You have many pastors that have participated in abortion themselves. They either took their wives or their side pieces or their daughters to get abortions themselves. Um, so at, on, as a whole, you would think that the black church is silent, but it is not. The Church of God in Christ in November of last year passed the, a resolution that they are a pro-life organization. They are committed to adopting children slated for abortion uh, and adopt children out of foster care. They are opening medical centers to provide free pre- and postnatal services to women who choose life. Um, and they are opening pregnancy centers. Now, why is that significant? That is significant because the Church of God in Christ is the largest black denomination in the United States with more than 7 million members. That came after a lot of hard work where we went to their conferences, we went to their convocations, we went to wherever we could go. Who is we? The Restoration Project and Douglas Leadership Institute. And after three years of working with them, they unanimously 
pass that resolution. So you are going to begin to see more activity from black churches because now it's provoking the AMEs and the Baptists and the Nazarenes and all the other denominations, the AME Zions, are now calling me and saying, will you come? And I'm happy to do it. <laughs> oh, that's a, that was a great question. Other questions? We got one over here. Here we go. Um, if you encountered, say, a 15-year-old black girl in one of those neighborhoods where Planned Parenthood is and she was pregnant, what would be your best uh, way to convince her not to go in the door? You know, that's a hard question to give a very generic answer to because it depends on how you're approaching her. It depends on what's happening in that environment. And, and so yelling at her, she's a murderer, is never going to get her to come over there and talk to you. Um, but typically, when we go in front of an abortion center, we just basically say, we can help you. Mm -hmm. And we hold signs, let us help you. Um, and we, we call out to them, would you come, at least get the information that we want to give you. And you'd be surprised if they come and they talk to you and you start telling them about the baby's heartbeat, that the baby's heart is beating after like six weeks, six to eight weeks, that the baby has fingernails, that the baby, you know, it, it is shocking to them, but it arrests them and it may turn, turn them around. But there's no one answer to that question because it depends on you being willing to let Holy Spirit use you as opposed to you deciding how you're going to do it. And let me say this, not everyone is called to go in front of an abortion center. <laughs> you, you must be called to that because otherwise you may be doing more harm than good. But if you are called, I would say, you know, pray because prayer changes things, always changes things. But be sensitive to the Lord because there may be, he may give you a word that will specifically resonate to that woman that you're trying to get to come talk to you. You know, so. Good question. Peggy? Here, wait, wait, wait. We got to have you. Here you go, sweetie. Um, in one of the workshops I was in, somebody asked a question about billboards and. I see in your bio that you have that campaign of endangered species. Could you talk about that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. I'm so glad you asked me that question. <laughs> we teed these up. You know, how many of you know Ryan Baumberger? He was Anybody know that name? He was here this he was, morning. Oh, see, <laughs> Ryan and I, I met Ryan in a diner in Alpharetta, Georgia. <laughs> Because a guy named Chad Bonham, I don't know if anybody knows Chad, had spoken to me. He had spoken to Ryan, and he said, do you know Ryan? No. Call him. I don't call men. <laughs> Give him my number. Have him call me. No, Catherine, you need to call. And he kept calling me and pestering me until I called Ryan. So Ryan and I got together in a diner in Atlanta. And I said, you know, Ryan, if people were on the endangered species list, black people would be on there. And he looked at me and he said, I say that all the time. And so we ate and we connected and it was good. And about four months later, Georgia Right to Life was having a conference in Macon, Georgia. Ryan drove to Macon, Georgia and brought me the Black Children on Endangered Species billboard. And it took my breath away. I don't know if you guys can pull that up, maybe. Um. Um, anyway, it, it, it was just this little black boy child with the most soulful eyes you've ever seen. And it just said, black children are endangered species, too many aborted.com. That was the most successful pro-life campaign, I think, that I had ever seen. Because the reason I'm saying that is that I was on ABC, NBC, CBS. I was on every station except Fox. <laughs> Fox did not run the story, but every mainstream media outlet did, besides Fox. I was on the front page of the New York Times looking very ugly, but it was still me. <laughs> it was, it was in the Times Square. 
D didn't you guys no, do? No, that was not ours. That was um, Heroic Media did that one. Okay. Um, but um, that campaign was the most news generating campaign that had come out in some time. And you know what Planned Parenthood did? They hired Rusinello consultants, PR firm, to craft a message to try to refute those billboards. And they formed another organization called Trust Black Women. That's where Trust Black Women came from, was because of that billboard campaign and the success that it had around the country. So today, the media suppresses our voices. They don't tell you what we're doing today. We did a National Day of Mourning in August where we had a processional of cars, vans, trucks, buses from Richmond, Virginia to Birmingham, Alabama. Did y'all hear about it? But every station showed up. They recorded it. They had all the information. They never ran with the story. Why? Because they were afraid of the message coming out of the hood. And so they suppress our voices. But that's OK, because we know God. <laughs> and so you're going to see some more things like that coming out of the black pro-life community. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Catherine. You've been wonderful. You, Thank you. You, for you were the exclamation point on the day and tied it all back in with Ryan. So it was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.